you're watching Nevada Business Chronicles. Take a journey with us to see the innovative businesses that put Nevada on the business map. Connecting you with the businesses, events, and organizations that bring innovation and prosperity to the Nevada area, please welcome your host, Mitch Burney. On today's episode, we're going to introduce you to one of the largest family-owned onion farmers in our country, David Perry with Perry & Sons Farms. Thanks so much for being on our show. Thanks for having me. I understand that this is generations of onion growers, so tell me a little bit about Perry & Sons Farms. Well, my grandfather migrated from Italy in 1912, uh, landed in Dayton, Nevada, and in 1918 he bought a little ranch in Lockwood, Nevada. Uh, right on the Truckee River and uh, started farming and they grew potatoes and onions and vegetables and uh, peddled them to the Reno area and then my, raised nine kids there. My dad and uncle after that uh, they ended up staying on their ranch. They were identical twins. I grew up there at Lockwood um, and in 1979 I moved to Yarrington, started uh, first onion crop in 1980 uh, and now we're fourth generation. My wife runs the whole administrative department. Uh, one of my daughters runs the sales department, uh, the onion sales. Uh, another one of my daughters runs the accounts receivable. Another one of my daughters works at the daycare. We provide uh, for all the employees' children. Uh, my son, he works out on the farm. And uh, my CFO, Stephanie, she's my boss. Let's take a look around. So you have quite a few acres here. Yeah, about 12,000. 12,000 acres. Yes. And you grow a lot of onions. The largest family-owned onion farm in the country? Uh, if we're not the largest, we're probably in the top five or six, yes. How many pounds of onions do you produce a year? Around 350 million. 350 million pounds of onions. And there's a process. You were telling me that there's about 15, 16 stages just to grow an onion. Yes. So what are we looking at on this field? So at this stage, there's already been about 12, 13 processes um, up to the drip tapes put into the soil. Um, that starts from ground prep. So first thing you do is you run a disc across it. You go into heavy rip and you have to re uh, GPS it, get all the highs and the lows out, get the lister, make the furrows again, then start the process of working the beds to get the soil in the right condition, to get the drip tape put in, uh, then install the fertilizer, and then the final process is to roll the beds back out and put the seed in the ground. Well, let's take a look at some of the processes going on on this side of the street. Okay. So after you get the drip tapes in and you've tilled it and you've gotten it to that status, what's the next process they're doing on this farm? Uh, then we overseed with oats. Uh, we roll the beds back out. And then the onion seeder comes, puts the onion seed in, and the sprinkler pipe comes behind that deer deer. So why do you overseed it with oats? Uh, it's mostly for uh, wind control. Um, the beds obviously are real flat. Uh, we can get 60, 70 mile an hour winds off these mountains here in northern Nevada. Uh, the soil's light in some of the ground we have. Um, it'll just blow the sand, cut the onions off, kill the onions, you don't have a crop. So the oats grows faster than the onions, it gets up and it gets protection from the soil blowing. Well, let's take a look at some of the equipment it takes to actually plant seeds. So what's this contraption? You've got a lot of machinery out here. Well, this is the final process. That's a vacuum seeder. So it runs under a vacuum off the GPS. The GPS uh, through the computer and the tractor is what sets, uh, you set the spacing you want desired down the row. And under vacuum, it picks up the seed against the plate. When it gets to the bottom, it drops the seed. So, for example, we plant, right now they're planting 190,000 seeds to the acre. 190,000 seeds, seeds to, the per, acre. to the acre. Yes. And what we're looking at right here is approximately how many of your 12,000 acres? Uh, this is roughly 45, 50 acres. Notice they're pulling the drip tape back up now. 
to hook up the water systems to it. But you have designed your own equipment to lay the drip tape. Uh, yes, we're the only ones that uh, install uh, six drip tape uh, on an 80 inch bed, so we had to design our own equipment to do that. Uh, most applicators only designed to put four, so we build our own applicators uh, in our own shop facility. And you do that because of efficiency? Uh, efficiency, we have uh, pretty loamy light soil here, so we want to be able to run the uh, drip system short period of time, have uniformity in water. Uh, we want all the plants getting the same amount uh, in short durations of water. So onions are shallow rooted, so we, we, uh, we want to give them a little bit of water often, and we want them all to be getting the same drink. Now, when you started in this industry, you didn't have all of this technology. How has that improved the farming operations? Oh, from the time we started, uh, we had 35 inch beds, these are 80. We were planting two lines on the 35, that's what we did when we were kids. Uh, when we moved to Mason Valley in 79, planted the first crop in 80, we had 40 inch beds, which were half the width of these, and we had four lines on top of them, and we ran the water down the furrow. Um, then we went from that, we went to sprinkling onions all the way through to make it more efficient. Uh, we went to five and six lines on a 40 inch bed. And uh, then by about 1995, we started switching all the drip, going to 80 inch beds, and that's where we're at today. You're an innovator in the industry of growing onions. Uh, we like to think so, and uh, you never quit learning in this industry. Always learning something, always trying to make improvements. With all the acreage you have, that must present some very serious irrigation challenges. Uh, yes, it does, but we've uh, worked real hard on mastering it. Uh, we have a pretty good program. Uh, the first thing we do, obviously, is see the sprinklers running. Uh, each one of them sprinklers has a pressure regulator under it, so it's all about being real uniform. Uh, they only allow 50 PSI out, so the bird at the top of the line or the bottom of the line, everything has the exact same amount of water coming out of it. Uh, we use the sprinklers to get the crops started, keep the top wet, dries out very quick. Uh, also when we get wind uh, to help control wind erosion. Uh, then once the crop gets going, we switch over to drip irrigation, which is the most efficient. It's in the ground, you get no evaporation. It's as uniform as possible. To produce 350 million pounds of onions, that must take an enormous amount of employees. Uh, yeah, um, we, uh, we, we have about 800 employees all summer. Uh, when we get into peak, we're harvesting veg and onions at the same time. Uh, we peak at about 1,700 people. Um, that uh, calculates out to uh, a huge payroll at that particular time. At our peak, we hit a million and a half a week at payroll. I want people to see onions differently and vegetables differently when they hit the shelves of the produce department. A million and a half a week to farm the produce that they're picking one up to take home with them. Yeah, that's just during harvest. That doesn't count anything to do with the growing season. Uh, that's at harvest, we hand harvest all of our onions. Uh, all of our uh, produce is all hand harvested also, whether it's broccoli or cauliflower or cabbage or iceberg lettuce or romaine lettuce. Uh, so it's all done by hand, so the, 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 the cost is enormous to get that pretty produce on the shelf. That doesn't count the land and the equipment, you have a lot of tractors. Yeah, we have over 100 John Deere tractors and over 300 licensed vehicles between pickups and trucks and everything, trailers, everything associated to pull behind the trucks. Uh, it takes a lot. Today we're harvesting. What's this process? Uh, well, the process is, is the uh, tractors that you see running, uh, they have a square bar that turns the opposite way that the tractor's going. It cuts the roots, lifts the onion up, and uh, the guys riding on there place the bags out uh, for the harvest crew. And then the harvest crew comes in and uh, they clip the onions, put them in, uh, clip the tops, put them in five gallon buckets. They put six buckets in a bag uh, and then we uh, leave them in the field, uh, let them cure for approximately uh, 10 to 12 days. Um, we uh, harvest the onions early in the season when it's uh, still hot, because we start in August, uh, we do uh, night harvest. 
So explain the curing process. Why do you have to cure an onion? Well, an onion likes to be dry. So as you can see, the tops still have some green in them. So they're gonna clip the top right about here, an inch or two from, from the bulb. And you want that to completely dry down. And we want the roots, which still have moisture in them, uh, to completely dry. Um, otherwise, a disease can enter in through any moisture in through the neck. Um, then once they're dry, they're hauled into storage. At that point, uh, they like to be stored around 34 degrees. So then you get them cold and storm at 34 degrees, but they have to be dry first so you don't have free moisture. So is this machine knocking down the plants? No, uh, the tops fall down uh, on their own. So how an onion grows is the first thing it does is it grows the top. So when it's growing, it grows this nice big top and then it's triggered a bulb by day length. And so this particular variety was probably triggered a bulb right around the 4th to the 10th of July. Then it puts its, all its energy to the bulb. It doesn't really grow a lot more top, grows some more growth out of the center, leaves fall off as it's growing. Once it gets mature, neck gets weak, they fall over. So basically they're like dominoes. One just pushes the other when they get weak, they all fall down. And that's when you know it's time to harvest? So they tell you automatically it's time to harvest? Um, well, there's a little bit more to it than that, but so to speak, uh, they do fall over on their own when they're mature. That's correct. I noticed these bags say organic on them. You really have control over that in this location. Uh, yes, we farm this entire 1,600 acre piece here. So everything around us where we grow organics um, is, is our own, so we control it. So we make sure we don't uh, have any drift from the non-organic uh, fields if they're in alfalfa or onions or a different crop. Um, we have control of that. What's going on with the machine that we see coming towards us right now? Uh, after the uh, onions cure in the bag, uh, you know, once they've been harvested, uh, these have been sitting in the bag uh, about 10 days. Um, now they're being loaded uh, into what we call V-bed trucks. Um, they have a continuous uh, belt in the bottom of them to unload them. Um, they'll go to, into storage from here. So this is just the process, uh, once they're field cured, uh, to bring them to storage. It's nice and chilly in here. Yeah, it's cool. It's well insulated. What are we standing in? We're standing in a plenum. Well, what does the plenum do in the harvesting of onions? Well, these are, this is a storage building. So you have to keep air moving through onions all the time. You can't keep them without air movement. So you have fans that pressurize this plenum blows the air through these troughs, goes up through the onions, comes back around, goes through the refrigeration coils because keep them about 34 degrees, and back, pressurize the plenum, goes around, goes back through the coils to keep the heat extracted all the time. Well, let's take a look at the other side where all of that happens. Now, this is a lot of onions, but this isn't even a full room. How many onions can you get into this room and how many of these do you have? Uh, each of these rooms holds 60,000 50-pound bags we have 60 of these rooms. Well, let's take a look at what you do when you take them out of here. Okay. There you go. Well, someone watching this may see sorting and packaging going on. This is really where the rubber meets the road. This is where Perry & Sons becomes the industry standard in onions. Yeah, I mean, it starts with the growing. We're one of the premier grower packers, shippers, is what, what we're known in the industry. And we are the premier packer uh, in the world. Uh, we high grade everything. We pack, uh, to, we have stringent pack rules. And so our finished product exceeds any standard in the industry. And that's what separates us from the rest of the grower packer shippers in the country. So after they're sorted and packed, they come into this staging area to be shipped. They're loaded in semis. Uh, we ship roughly 250 to 300 semi loads a week. That's 50 to 60 semis a day from September to... Yeah, our busiest season is September through January. Uh, that's 250, 300 loads a week. Uh, the rest of the year, we're 150 to 200 loads a week. Year round? Year round. That's a lot of onions. Earlier, you said to me that you have, during the harvest season, as many as 1,700 people harvesting. Where do they sleep? In the fields? Uh, no, we have housing. Uh, we bring everybody in on an H-2A work visa. Uh, they're seasonal workers and we have to provide housing, transportation. 
Uh, I'll show you where we house them. Oh, let's take a look at that. You were talking about housing 1,700 people. These are apartments. Yes, uh, we have uh, apartments for roughly 1,000 people. Uh, it takes 800 to 1,000 all season long uh, between the veg and the onion. And uh, then we have housing for an additional 700 uh, that come in just strictly for the onion harvest. Uh, they're here for about six, seven weeks. That's amazing. I know I'm not going to be alone. Overwhelmed, blown away with your operation here in Yarrington, never knew. And I'm sure a lot of other people right now are going, what? You make me proud to live in Nevada, and I want to thank you for having us out here today. Well, thank you. I got to ask you one question. Onions. There's got to be a lot of crying that goes on around here, too. Well, actually, uh, we're in the process of introducing a new sweet onion that is actually tearless. Uh, so um, onions have been known to create a lot of crying, but <laughs> I, uh, we, we are working on an onion that's been 30 years in the development, and uh, it's a tearless onion. So uh, coming soon, uh, we'll be offering a tearless onion. Can't wait to talk about that on another episode. If you're a retailer and you want to carry Perry & Sons onions and you don't now, just visit their website, perryandsons.com. Thank you again so much for having us. Thank you. For more information on this guest or to see this show in its entirety, visit nvbusinesschronicles.com. While you're there, you can watch all of our past shows on the Chronicles page and stay connected with us by following us on our social media. Now more from Nevada Business Chronicles. We're back at Carpenter's Music World with Wendell Carpenter. And on a previous episode, we featured your piano rentals for the first time. So successful, you wanted to make sure everybody could afford to have a piano. Your goal was a piano in every home. And you announced a $35 a month rental. And you're going lower. That's right, I had so much fun at that. We had people come in and uh, I decided I wanted to clear all my pianos out. I'd rather have them in homes than here at the store. So we've got dropped that to $25 a month. Before that, you can rent spinet pianos, console pianos, upright pianos, old fashioned pianos. You have a variety. This isn't a price leader, come in, get one piano at $25 a month. So theoretically, somebody could come in and rent three or four pianos for $75 to $100 a month. That's right, if they've got, if they want a his and hers or one for each of the kids, why well, we can do that. The rental isn't just a rental of an instrument. It's a rental of a finely restored, refurbished, ready to play instrument. So let's talk about what you do to prepare a piano for rental. It's not just it comes in, it goes out for $25 a month here at Carpenter's Music World. That's right. We like it to look good if we can. We like it to look as good as possible. Uh, but more important than that, we go through and clean it. And we uh, make sure that uh, the dust is out, that it's going to look nice in the home and sound nice. And then we go through the action mechanism and make sure all of the keys play properly. Uh, we tune it, make sure that all of the notes hold the pitch, hold the tuning, so that when they get the piano, they have a, a fine musical instrument as well as uh, a good-looking instrument. I think this is really important because people may think they can look on, you know, these internet sites for you know private cell pianos you never know what you're going to get and really in a piano there's a lot of potential for repairs being needed and so buying that way is very dangerous for a consumer that just thinks oh i can go out and buy one really inexpensively there's usually you know a good deal is sometimes too good to be true in the world of trying to figure that out and sort that out yourself if you're not a piano expert. So I highly encourage people to avoid that when they see that they can get one here at $25 a month that's been restored properly. So let's talk about what you go through inside this piano because I think if people see the mechanisms, they'll understand why it's important for them to come here and do business with you than to take that risk. So let's take a look inside one. So let's take a look under the hood. Immediately, I see a lot, did I say a lot? More than a lot, an enormous number of moving parts. That there is. Uh, pianos are a very complex mechanism. And uh, this is why it's important to have a technician go through them and make sure that everything is working properly. Until I saw this, I had no idea how complex a machine is. It's called a piano because this is just one 
key on a keyboard. And there's a lot going on. So explain to me what's happening in the action of a upright. The cap then goes up, pushes on the whipping, which pushes on the jack, which pushes on the hammer butt, which pushes the hammer close to the, uh, farther toward the string so that it strikes the string. If I didn't put, push the key down hard enough, uh, the hammer would never strike the string. So it, it does that. At the same time, there's a spoon back here that lifts the damper off the string so that it continues to vibrate. At an exactly appropriate time, uh, a little button here pushes the jack out from underneath the hammer butt so that the hammer falls back and the, key, the string keeps vibrating. So all of this happens every time you play a key on the piano. If I play the key hard, a catcher here uh, catches the, the back of the hammer so that it doesn't bounce up and hit the string again. Uh, so uh, This is one out of 88 <laughs> of these that you have That's to right. go through before you put a piano out on your floor for somebody to rent. That is right. You check them all. Yes. And you have an assurance to your customers that rent a $25 a month piano. It comes with your word that this is going to hold a tune. Yes. And it's quite frankly a lot easier for me to get it ready in the store than it is to go out to the customer's home three or four times and fix things. Here's what's really fascinating. Somebody that comes in and says, I know I want to own this piano. I want it and I want to own it and I want to pay it off sooner. You can give them a shorter term and adjust the payment accordingly. So on three years, how much would this piano cost me to rent to own a month? Now, I'm glad you asked that because we've checked it out. And it's actually $43.06 per month. And they're done in three years. Right. They own this piano. And they've saved a lot of interest. And so you have choices, you have options. And I think one of the other options is fascinating, is I get this in my home, absolutely loving it, and decide I want to upgrade. Because you have everything up to grand pianos that you rent as well. So how does that work? It works really well. In fact, we, uh, we just, uh, that's what we kind of hope for. I tell people I, I, I'm mad if they trade up, but I'm not really. <laughs> uh, the best piano that you can, uh, can afford should always be in your home. The better piano you have, the faster your children will progress and the more time they'll spend practicing the piano. So I rent this for $25 a month. Two years later, I decide I want a nicer, newer, different style piano. What does that look like? How does that work? That would be a very good decision. What we do is we take all of the equity that you've accrued in this piano and transfer it to the next piano. So uh, I don't, you don't lose, lose anything. anything. We said it at the same time, it must be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure people watching right now are going for $25 a month. I'm coming down right now. I'm getting this piano or another one that's here. What's the process look like? All I need to do is come in, select the piano, and we have them fill out a rental application so that we can that we do uh, rent these on approved credit. So they have to do that. Uh, if they do it right away, uh, in fact, any time between now and the end of this year, uh, we'll give them half off on their delivery charge. Now through December 31st, 2017, half off on the delivery. There's also something else that I'd like to let people know. Coming up in the month of October, starting on the 18th of October, you're having your pre-holiday store-wide clearance sale as well. We know that people are going to be very involved with uh, Christmas shopping, so this gives them time to buy a piano and get a piano of their choice at a special price before all of the rush. Or any other thing in the store, you're having a store-wide clearance, and this is a pre-holiday sale, and you're right, avoid the rush, avoid the crowds, and be able to take advantage of a pre-holiday store-wide clearance at Carpenter's Music World. And you can find them at 1090 Kitsky Lane. Give them a call at 775-852-7618 or carpentersmusic.com. Thanks, Wendell, for having us. Well, thanks for being here. For more information on this guest or to see this show in its entirety, visit nvbusinesschronicles.com. While you're there, you can watch all of our past shows on the Chronicles page and stay connected with us by following us on our social media. Now more from Nevada Business Chronicles. Let's take a look at the television show, Sober Footprints. Sober speaks for itself. It's the goal. It's the coveted prize. It's the thing we want people to be able to achieve is sobriety. Footprints, we're referring to the footprints of those that have traveled the road to recovery, the footprints that they've left for others to follow. 
So on this show, we're actually going to have a series of intermittent sober footprints. People always ask me, well, how do we help people in addiction? You know how you help people? You love them right where they're at. Um, because that's that's the most important thing. Don't try to beat them over the head and say, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. Because a lot of times people did that to me and I refused it, I rejected it. You know, and you gotta kind of love people right where they're at and, and find out what's really going on with them and walk with them. You know, don't turn your back. You know, I had some good friends who walked along the road with me. Um, never turned their back, um, never questioned me. Even when I was in the midst of my addiction, they loved me right where I was at and that's what's really important. If you find yourself struggling with alcohol and drug addiction, you feel hopeless, lost, broken, your friends and family are leaving you, pick up the phone and ask for help. It is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. It's the one call that can save your life. It can turn really bad gray skies into beautiful blue skies. Pick up the phone, make the call. There's somebody to answer. With nowadays, with the drugs being so severe, I think you're one step away from anybody overdosing or, or dying. So if you have a, a problem with addiction, you should contact either your community or somebody around your community or somebody who's in addiction that you uh, will, will try to get help. But I think it's uh, nowadays you shouldn't be shameful of, of addiction or what you're going through because there are a lot of people out there going through the same problems you're going through. We have a website that's under construction right now called SoberFootprints.com. On the website SoberFootprints.com, there's also gonna be an if you need help, click here link to USARehabCenters.org. Again, one of the problems is where do you turn? Where do you go? So we're building, this is under construction, a national database of providers and services where people that want to know where to turn can go access the information in a way that it's never been at your fingertips before. If you're a business owner, a philanthropist, or just somebody who wants to get involved and help make a difference, or if you have a service that you want to list on the usarehabcenters.org website, please reach out and contact me at contact at soberfootprints.com, or better yet, give me a call personally, 775-287-0107. It's going to take a community to make this possible. Let's band together and make a difference. Thanks for watching. For more information on this guest or to see this show in its entirety, visit nvbusinesschronicles.com. While you're there, you can watch all of our past shows on the Chronicles page and stay connected with us by following us on our social media. For information on becoming a guest on our show, contact us at info at nvbusinesschronicles.com. We hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching. Tune in next week at the same time for more from Nevada Business Chronicles.